supporting a wife and three daughters. Applegat served as a royal messenger for the court of Edirne in the 13th century, trained not only to ride swiftly as he carried letters between the allied northern kingdoms, but also to memorize any vital information which could not be trusted to pen and paper and relay it word for word. Throughout the years of his service, Applegat noticed a steady decline in work as the nobility turned more and more to sorcerers who could conjure portals and deliver messages in mere moments. Yet in the year 1267, as tensions mounted with the Nilfgaardian Empire of the South, the northern monarchs began to lose faith in their mages, no longer trusting them with vital information, meaning Applegat and the royal messengers were once again in high demand. With the threat of war looming, Applegat was summoned by King Demavend of Edirn and given a special message for his ally Foltest of Temeria. Making his way westward, Applegat stopped by an inn for the night and in the morning went to the stables where he ran into a beautiful black-haired woman and a pale white-haired girl with emerald eyes. Being polite, he greeted the young girl who suddenly looked at him in a daze and spoke a vision of doom. Danger, she said. The danger is quiet. You won't hear it getting closer on its gray feathers. I had a dream. The sand. The sand was warm from the sun. Snapping out of the trance, the girl Siri was called outside by the woman Yennefer, leaving Applegat confused and disturbed as he prepared to depart. At last arriving before the king, he delivered the memorized message. Demavend to Foltest. All is ready in Dolangra. The masqueraders are waiting for orders. Plan time of action, second night of November, after the new moon. The boats must land on the other side of the river two days later. Hearing the words, Foltest issued his reply. Foltest to Demavend. First, postpone the action. Smart asses are preparing a convent in Thaned. This convent might change a lot. Second, the search for the lion cub can be called off. It's confirmed, the cub is dead. These messages refer to the preparations for war being made across the Northern Kingdoms, which were setting up a false flag operation to attack a Northern stronghold with troops dressed in Nilfgaardian armor. Using this event as a justification, the Northern Kings could descend upon the South in full force, taking back the lands lost in the previous war. The monarchs also agreed to search for and assassinate the Princess Cirilla, sole heir to Queen Calanthe, as they believed the Emperor wanted her to solidify his control over Sintra. And so in the first message from Demavant to Foltest, he explained that his men would be ready to launch a false flag attack in November. However, in the reply, he was asked to postpone the plan, as the Brotherhood of Sorcerers was planning a meeting on Thanet which could have important consequences. With his mission completed, Applegat returned to Demavend, who then issued new orders, sending him first to Foltest of Temeria and then Redania. After delivering the new message to Foltest, Applegat made his way north, stopping at an inn for a meal, and there met the Witcher, Geralt of Rivia, watching on in shock as he killed three mercenaries who were searching for the woman Yennefer and girl Ciri. Continuing on his way to Tredegor, Applegat expected to meet with King Visimir, but was instead taken to Sigismund Dykstra, head of Redanian intelligence, who was authorized to deal with these matters. Relaying the message, he said, From Demavan to Visimir, First, the masqueraders are ready for the second night after the full moon in July. Second, I will not be gracing the assembly of the crafty on Thanet Island with my presence, and I advise you do the same. Third, the lion cub is dead. The reply came as follows. From Vizimir to Demavend, contain absolutely the masqueraders. There has been a betrayal. The flame has gathered an army in Dolangra and is waiting for any excuse. In these messages, Demavend said the false flag attack was moved to July in order to coincide with the sorcerers meeting on Thanet. However, Dykstra replied to call off the attack completely because Nilfgaard learned of their plan and moved troops into the area who were waiting for any excuse to launch a full-on invasion. As Applegat spoke to Dykstra, he also told him the story of the White Wolf, Geralt, killing the mercenaries. And so Dykstra deduced that despite the belief of the monarchs, the Lion Cub Ciri must still be alive, otherwise the Witcher would not be concerned about those in pursuit. Departing from Tredegor, Applegat was now in possession of a vital message which could affect the future of the entire continent. Yet as fate would have it, the information was never delivered, as the royal messenger was spotted riding down the road by elven rebels from the Scoyatel, non-humans fighting to take back their ancient homeland from the Northern Kingdoms. 
Although the elf Teruviel asked her companion not to shoot, as they were only on a scouting mission, asking if their cause had fallen so low as to pointlessly kill passing civilians on the road, to which Yevin replied yes, taking the shot to instantly kill Applegat, who then fell off his horse, leaving his face in the warm sand, dying just as Ciri foresaw. Since Applegat was unable to deliver this crucial message, Demavend went through with the false flag operation, starting a war with the well-prepared Nilfgaardian Empire, allowing the South to launch a massive invasion which nearly conquered the North. Hailing from the Griffin School in Povis, the Witcher Cohen was a good-natured man who, for a time, wintered in the Wolf School of Kermoran to the east. While visiting with his Witcher colleagues, Geralt of Rivia adopted a young girl named Ciri, bringing her to live in the fortress and train in their ways. Growing close to the girl, Cohen not only trained her in sword fighting, but also took the role of a fun uncle, spending his free time keeping her company and playing games. And while they were not together for long, he played an important role in her development, with Ciri remembering the man and his lessons long after they were parted. Yet as the Witchers spent more time with the girl, it became clear she possessed some strange innate magical abilities, as one day she fell into a trance and spoke a prophecy of doom, foreseeing the deaths of Cohen, who would die from two teeth, and Geralt who would fall to three. After leaving Kaer Morhen, Cohen heard about Nilfgaard's invasion of the north, and while his fellows in the Wolf School valued neutrality, Cohen did not feel the same way, volunteering to defend their lands from conquest. As always, Cohen was quick to make friends with his comrades in arms, and together they marched to fight in the decisive Battle of Brenna, where he proved himself a master swordsman, slaying many foes until caught by a pitchfork which stabbed him through the heart. Despite the grievous wound, the Witcher's mutations allowed him to survive long enough for his friends to bring him to the medical tent, but there was nothing to be done, and so he died under the care of Dr. Milo Vanderbeck, killed by two teeth, just as Ciri foresaw. For eight generations, the de Reuter family served with honor as warriors of Redania, and so Count Cobus de Reuter continued the tradition, entering his first battle at the age of 16. Forty years later, the veteran warrior once again led men to war, this time in the Battle of Brenna as the armies of the north rallied to defend against Nilfgaardian conquest. Leading the forces of Tredegor, Cobus found himself rallying his men in the midst of battle when he spotted the Nilfgaardian Venendel division reorganizing to defend against an attack from Redanian cavalry. Realizing they needed to prevent the enemy from tightening their formation, he grabbed the banner from one of his men and valiantly led a mad charge into enemy ranks, succeeding in keeping them distracted and chaotic long enough for the cavalry to arrive and smash their forces. However, Count Cobus de Reuter would not live to see victory, as he was shot with a crossbow bolt and collapsed to the ground where the banner he was holding draped over him like a shroud. As Count Cobus fought and died on the battlefield of Brenna, eight generations of de Reuter warriors watched from another world and nodded in approval. Though born into the peasant class, Yola II was accepted into the temple school of Melitele under the oversight of Mother Nenica, a wise and influential priestess of great repute. During her time at school, Yola befriended a number of girls, as well as Yara, an apprentice scholar who was the only boy on temple grounds. For a time, she grew closest to Yurnid and a white-haired, green-eyed girl named Ciri, but they eventually had a falling out when the sorceress Yennefer of Vengerberg arrived to provide special classes for the lion cub of Sintra. When the Second Northern War erupted and the armies of the Northern Kingdoms were called to battle, the temple was summoned to do their part, sending as many healers and specialists as they could. Though she was sad to leave Mother Nenica and her friends, Yola bravely went without protest, assigned to work under the halfling field surgeon Milo Vanderbeck at a medical tent in the Battle of Brenna. Joining them was Shawnee, a medical student from Oxenfurt University, and Marty Sodegren, a sorceress who specialized in healing spells. Though Yola went into battle a child, she emerged a grown woman as the experience was so horrible and exhausting she was utterly transformed. 
Among the many broken and mutilated bodies, Yola saw the death of the Witcher Cohen, which brought a tear to her eye, likely because she was reminded of when the Witcher Geralt came to visit Ciri and Mother Nenica in the temple. At one point in the chaos of it all, she found her old friend Yara bleeding to death, learning that he ran away from the temple to join the war effort. Bringing him to the tent, she ensured his survival, though the injury cost the young man his hand. When a group of enemy elves burst into the tent and started killing patients, Yola threw herself over one of the bodies to protect him, and Dr. Milo joined her, trying to stand between them. Yet they were no match for the soldiers, who threw them both aside, only to discover the man they were protecting was an elf guardian, an ally of the elves, meaning that even though this was a northern medical tent, they were healing the wounded from both sides. Shocked by this revelation, and learning the Northmen were approaching, they hastily departed, leaving Yola huddled on the ground in tears. When at last the battle was over and the work was done, the four of them drank vodka and relaxed with an intoxicant spell, not knowing or caring who won the battle. With the war ended and her obligations fulfilled, Yola was expected to return to the temple, but too much had changed, and so she instead dedicated her life to healing, following Milo Vanderbeck to work at a hospital in Maribor. Mother Nenica was proud. When the Catriona Plague struck the north and ravaged Maribor, both Milo and Yola refused to leave the city, remaining to treat as many as they could. What they did not know was that the disease was actually spread by Yola's old friend Ciri, who had since become a witcher sorceress of enormous power, able to travel between dimensions and worlds. During one of these journeys, she accidentally transported diseased fleas from a foreign world into her own, spreading a plague which wiped out thousands. In the end, Milo Vanderbeck contracted the illness and died in the arms of Yola II. Yola also had the disease and died four days later alone. Love The Witcher or any other series? Then why not check out Audible, where they have the largest collection of audiobooks available. Sign up now and get one free audiobook and two Audible originals, or else give the gift of membership to someone you know. If you prefer to read your stories, then click on the link to the Kindle Unlimited plan and get access to as many ebooks as you want. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the excellent Witcher audiobooks, narrated by Peter Kenny, including the main novels and short stories which accompany the series. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Ellen Dill of Numenor, Tamika Blackwolf, the Dragon Princess, and Alex Nunez. If you'd like to help the channel, go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can sign up and gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and access the Patreon-only series Heroes of Lore and Legends.